Well, good morning, Rust Church. We wanted to sing the blessing for you this week to give you blessings for your Thanksgiving week. So if you'd like to stand and join us, we're going to get started off this morning singing, This is Amazing. I mean, it was good for all of you. I mean, most of you. Dave, come on. All right. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. I'm glad you're here. Uh, we've got, obviously, Thanksgiving uh, coming up tonight, and we've got Thanksgiving on Thursday. We've got Thanksgiving all the time, if you want. So bear that in mind. Tomorrow or tonight, <laughs> the one day, I shouldn't have said, not tomorrow. Tonight, we have our Thanksgiving dinner here at the church. 
Uh, make sure that you pick up from the Welcome Center everything you need. And by the way, we still have plenty of room in the 7 o'clock seating. So if you want to come on by, come on by. All right. We're going to deck the halls on Tuesday at uh, 6 in the evening. Uh, now, we kind of work on that a little bit throughout the day, too. And so we're not going to be here all night. Uh, but we'll be able to decorate the church for that and get that ready. And finally, there is still room for TCTC. Uh, please talk to Cody about that if you or if you want to go, actually, uh, but also if uh, as a chaperone, but if your kids want to go to TCTC, if they're a team, they can go as well. It should be a lot of fun. Uh, let's keep all that stuff in mind as we praise Jesus, as we worship him today, as we give thanks today. Father, we do thank you. We thank you for the love that you have for us and that you show all the time you give with both hands, whether uh, it, is, it is our minds, our hearts, our lives, the, just the purpose and the value that we have. I thank you, Father, that your love knows no end. I thank you that we get to sing on the best days and on the worst days. We get to sing praises to Jesus because we know he's already won. He's won it for us. And we thank you for that, Father, that we will one day get to live in your rest. And that's why we sing today. That's why we celebrate Thanksgiving every day because of who you are and what you do. Father, and that's what we do right now. Right now as we sing, uh, good morning or bad morning, we are going to sing thanksgiving to what Jesus did for us on the cross. It's in his name we pray.
absence of wrong. My sin washed away in your blood. Too much to make sense of it all. I know that your love breaks my fall. The scandal of grace, you died in my place, so oh, my soul. From the first chapter of John, now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was, John the Baptist. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. 
Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Why then do you baptize if you're not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied. But among you stands one who you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said a man who comes after me was, has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself didn't know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. There is, in John's words, a tremendous, you can feel, you can feel the admiration that, G, uh, that John has for Jesus Christ. He's, he's awestruck when Jesus walks by. In fact, he tells everybody around him, he says, stop, stop, look, look. There's the lamb walking this way. Last week when we talked about, uh, when we were preparing for communion, Dad talked about Thanksgiving. And I want to take it the next step now. We, we begin with Thanksgiving when we remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But it does not help us. It does not behoove us to stay there. We need to graduate into a state of admiration for who he is and what he is. In fact, it's admiration that prepares us, not just for this Thanksgiving meal right here, but the eternal Thanksgiving meal. There will be a day when we come around this eternal Lord's table and we get to participate in the supper of the Lamb. That's what it says in Revelation. And that is drawing us into this absolute, complete dedication and admiration for who Jesus is, what Jesus is, and what he continues to do. This is the beginning. Thanksgiving is good. And that's what this does. But that's not where you stay. You grow. I grow into admiration. And so while you're participating in this today, we're going to partake of the loaf. We're going to partake of the cup. If you believe in Jesus, if you've given your life to Jesus, you ought to participate in this. And I want you to have a, a heart of genuine thanksgiving. But I also now, I want you to begin thinking. I want you to begin contemplating that this is the same God that put the stars in the sky. The same God that created you, built you, came up with you, invented you, and didn't forget anything, put everything in its place. I want you to begin to move towards admiration for who Jesus is and what Jesus is. You see, it's because of this admiration that we want to be in his presence. If it's just thanksgiving, which is good, we're very thankful for what he does. But now I want to admire what he is. Tozer puts it this way. Thanksgiving is a good thing. But as long as the worshiper is engrossed with himself and his good fortune, he's a baby. We begin to grow up when our worship passes from thanksgiving into admiration. How different and how wonderful are the emotions aroused by a true and spirit-incited love for Christ. Think about it, friend. A true bride is not just thankful she is getting married, but she loves the groom. 
Similarly, when you observe the Lord's Supper, you should not only be thankful for Jesus' broken body and his shed blood. You should also see in that act the greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You should see Jesus declaring his love for you, and you should do likewise. If participating in the Lord's Supper helps you grow in your love for Jesus, like a bride loving her groom, then you are making yourself ready for the far greater feast that yet awaits. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you. We do thank you. We we thank you for, for what you do. We thank you for what you have done. And we remember that now. But Father, we we want to, we desire to be in your presence, to be around you, to see you, God himself, to look up to you, to admire a genuine heartfelt desire to be in your presence, Father. And I, I, I have it more and more every day. I want to be with Jesus, see him and know him in a way that I don't know now. I want to continue to remember what he has done, what he has done for me, what he has done for people, what he has done for this world. But Father, I also ask that you put in this this heart of ours, this heart of mine, a genuine admiration for the very character of who your son is. May we dwell upon that. May we think upon that right now in this moment. It's in his son, it's in your son's name. Amen. I have determined this is a recent decision, okay? I have determined that I'm going to cut by about half of the things I teach Sam how to do, okay? I think half would do it. In fact, I'm going to stick to everything outside of the house. That's that's what I'm going to do. 
I, I think life is going to be a lot better. I think I'm going to be happier. I think Sam's going to be happier. But here's the thing. I'm absolutely certain Ashley's going to be happier with that. Okay? I can't tell you how many times. It's like he's playing a trick on me. He will ask me, well, how do you do that? How do we do that? How do you want to do that? Particularly with his schoolwork. All right, well, how do you do this? All right, well, here's how you do it. You show you this, show you this, take this, you know, you try this, you go this way. And, and I'm holding my breath because I just know. And here it comes. He says, well, that's not the way mom does it. Ah! <laughs> you already knew? Why'd you ask? Mom doesn't do it that way. So I'm just cutting some of this out, you know. He wants to learn reading, writing, and arithmetic. He's going to have to ask somebody else. He's going to have to ask one of you, or he's going to have to ask mom, one of, the, one of the two. All right, everything outside of the house, I'll take care of that. I'm just waiting. I'm waiting for the day, right? He tells my lovely wife. I don't think he plays this game with her, though. I think he plays it with me. And I don't even want to answer sometimes. He'll ask me a question, and I'll look at him sideways. Trying to figure out if he's playing me. Do you already know? Do you want to know? Do you really want to know? Okay, here's how I would do it. It's not what mom says. Ah! How do you do it? How do you do it? We figure out how to do stuff, right? I mean, and we figure out how to do things from all kinds of people. And we figure out the right way, and sometimes it's through figuring out the wrong way to figure out how to do things. We got to make a lot of mistakes sometimes in the process. But figuring out how, discovering how, I think really begins to make it a part of our lives. It, 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 it recreates who we are. Instead of just telling us how, if we begin to go through the journey, if we begin to go through the search, if we begin to go through the research and we do the trial and error and we begin to figure this stuff out, we are led, we are taught, we are told, and that's fine. But then we get into it and we kind of get our hands dirty with it. I think it really becomes a part, changes who we are. Today, we talk about how, how, how you do church or how you are the church. Now, this is just part one of this. You see, next week we get into the specifics. Next week we get into church structure, church polity. We get into church ministries. We get into uh, charity. We get into all of these kind of things uh, when we talk about how the church around the world and the church here in Russellvania operates. But today, I want to answer the grander question of how. How do I do all of these things? How do I live out, more to the point, how do I live out my purpose? How do I live out my purpose? Because we've already learned what our purpose is. Certainly, if you define yourself as the church, today we want to figure out how to live up to my purpose. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Again, we thank you for the opportunity to learn, to know, Father, to understand. We thank you that we can apply the wonderful things of your word to our life. But we, we thank you also, Father, that we can begin to look back and see the change in our lives and our minds and our hearts because of what you do. Father, we ask that we are true and accurate to your word in all ways. We ask, Father, that you open our eyes and our ears today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to tell you to turn to a particular passage, a particular verse. However, we're going to jump around a fair bit. But if you'd like, you can turn to Matthew chapter 22, and we'll be starting in verse 37 a little bit later on here in the message, but Matthew chapter 22. And once you read, start reading in verse 37, you're already going to start putting this together as far as how we live out our purpose. We've talked about, we've asked and answered a few questions. We started out with what is the church, and again, you have to add who, right? Who is the church? The church are those people in this world, in, in the past and now and in the future, who have given their lives to Jesus Christ, given their lives to Jesus. They, 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 they want their lives secured by the Savior. They want their lives secured eternally, and so they give what they are and all that they are 
over to Jesus Christ. That's the what or that's the who of the church. Then when we asked and answered the question, where? Where is the church? Church is all over the place. If you think about it, if that's the definition of the church, church is everywhere. The church is here in Russellvania. It's in the next town over. It's in towns across the world. It's in businesses. It's in it's families. I mean, it's all over the place when we think about where the church is. you got brothers and sisters all over the place. You ought to treat them that way. They ought to treat you that way. Then you begin to see this incredible connection of the church all over the world. Sometimes we fail to see that, and it makes us sad. It makes us apprehensive. It makes us angry. I mean, there's all kinds of things. When we fail to see that this church is worldwide throughout time and throughout history, even people, and it was in that message, even people we disagree with. You know, sometimes we disagree on little tiny things. Sometimes we disagree on big things that have to do with, uh, you know, just, just worldwide events, incredible things. And we disagree sometimes. But you can disagree with someone who has given their life over to Jesus. Because you and me and they go through a process of understanding. They go through a process of learning. They go through a process of growing. They go through a process of sanctification, being perfected. And the person you're talking to may have given their lives to Jesus Christ and may not know what you know, may not hear what you hear, may not understand, may not be able to see at this point. What you see, this is precisely what Jesus said. This is why he says this when we talk about judging the salvation of another person. He says, don't do that. Don't do that. Look, you can look at fruits. You can look at uh, uh, teaching. You can look at all that kind of stuff. He says, but there's a lot of people you're going to disagree with that still have given their lives over to Jesus Christ. That's the where. Where is the church? When? When's the church? Well, the church, of course, isn't just on Sunday morning. It's a good thing to do if that's what you want to do. But you are, you are malnourished if this is all. If this is your, your extent of church involvement, uh, you are malnourished. In fact, since we know the definition of the church, I would suggest that this is the extent of your church involvement. You need to wonder if you are the church, right? The church is done all the time. Wherever you go, whatever you do, you ought to be the church. It's like, how do you be father? Or when do you do mother? Or when do you do human being? All the time, and you try to do it to the very best, the very best way that you can. And so that's when the church is. That's when you do church. And we also discovered that this church started 2,000 years ago on the day of Pentecost. Last week, we asked about the why. What is our purpose? What is your purpose? If you're the church, what's your purpose in life? Forget about the other stuff, okay? What is your purpose of life? The other stuff's going to find its place. It's going to find its time. What is your purpose in life? If you claim to be the church, your purpose is to be a royal priest. That's your job. That's your job, to be a royal priest. And if you don't want to be a royal priest, you don't want to accept Jesus. Bottom line. If you don't want to be a royal priest, you don't want to accept Jesus. Because that comes along with it. To be a royal priest, witnessing for Jesus Christ, serving as his body, proclaiming his praises. That's your purpose. That's your job. Do you have other things that are important? Absolutely. You've got a million things that are important in your life and things you ought to focus on, things you ought to do but not at the expense of living out your eternal purpose given to you by God himself. There's a lot of things we can do, and we can change, and we can move, and we can like, and we can not like, but that purpose is given by God. So how do I do that? How do I do it? What's step one? We're going to look at many specific steps next week, but, and that's kind of what, what we're waiting for, I think. But, but what is step one? How do I do that? We start at the beginning in this broad way. And we start by knowing, understanding, and applying the Word of God. It's interesting, we started this series with that same thing. Knowing, understanding, and applying the Word of God. That's another way of saying knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Knowing the Word, understanding the Word, and applying the Word properly. Wisdom's the hardest part, by the way. Wisdom is the hardest part in knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Wisdom is, can be, should be, synonymous with obedience to Christ. 
That's wise living, skillful living, proper living, obedience to Jesus Christ. You don't have to add anything else in there if you don't want. Wisdom is obedience to Christ. If we are disobedient to Jesus Christ, this is obviously, or I hope it's obvious, a very unwise move. When you thumb your nose at the king, it's probably not the best move. Now we're talking about the king of all that there is. Knowing is the easiest part. Knowledge, understanding, wisdom. Knowing is the easiest part. Knowing is the bottom rung. That is the, that is the lowest possible, possible mark of the follower of Jesus Christ. It cannot get any lower. It cannot get any easier. Okay? Knowing is the accumulation of facts. Knowing is reading the word. It is the, it's not even a mark. It's, it's something you could merely just step over. It's the easiest thing you can possibly do as a follower of Jesus Christ. If we can't do that, if we don't want to do that, forget about everything else I'm talking about. You got a job to do. The easiest thing. Start there. Frustrates me. Frustrates me. It is the easiest thing you can do as a follower of Christ. Knowledge. To read the word of God. Step one, Step zero. To read the Word of God. If you can't read, some people can't read, right? You can listen to it. People have done that their whole lives. People, they tell. They tell the Word. Talk the Word. Read the Word to someone. We can do it today. We can plug in some headphones. We, we get the whole world at our fingertips and certainly the whole Word. Knowledge is the easiest part. Read the Word. That's how you know. Acquiring knowledge is facts. And then you study those facts. This is a little bit difficult, a little bit more difficult. You begin to ask questions. This usually involves meditation. Roll it over and over and over in your mind. I promise you, you can meditate because you worry. Shouldn't worry, right? But if you worry, you can meditate. Because you're rolling something over and over and over in your mind. You're just rolling over and over in your mind the wrong thing. Okay? Meditation. Go over it, know it, digest it, understand it. The entire first chapter of John, try the entire first verse, right? Know it, what it is. Begin asking questions about it. I ask questions of people all the time. I ask questions of people when I began this message right here today. Begin asking questions. I would send emails. I would look through books. I would do this. I I ask questions all the time. Help me understand. Make sure I know what this means. Knowledge, understanding. Understanding requires just a little bit of work. Harder than knowledge, but easier than wisdom. And by the way, the word of God is not for the lazy person. I love what A.W. Pink says. He says, the Bible is no lazy man's book. Much of its treasure, like the valuable minerals stored in the recesses of the earth, only yield up themselves to the diligent seeker. No verse of Scripture yields its meaning to the lazy person. And that is precisely what Jesus says, not in those words. Jesus is asked, why do you teach in parables? Why do you teach in stories? His disciples ask. He says this, because the people who want to know are going to know. People who don't want to know are never going to know. That's it. That's why I teach in parables. And finally, you apply that understanding. That's wisdom. The proper application of knowledge, this requires obedience, it requires humility, it requires courage. Again, we are asking, answering the question, how do I live out my purpose? Obedience, humility, courage, it requires trial and error. Trial and error. I mean, there's a lot of times I'll try to live out a particular passage, or I'll try to live out a particular meaning, or I'll try to do this, try to do that, and I mess it up. My guess is you've probably messed it up once or twice before as well. Trial and error, and you keep moving. That's what, that's what wisdom means. That, that builds wisdom, grows into it. I like what Jesus says. We'll get to this verse a little bit later on, but I like Jesus talk about his teaching and his words. He says, those who hear these words of mine and put them into practice, and I know this is just semantics, but I like how he says put it into practice and not put it into perfection. Put it into practice. Work on it. Work on it. If you're going to fail, you're going to succeed, work on it. Of course, James says the same thing. You've heard this many times, at least from this pulpit, James chapter 1. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. 
Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks his face in the mirror and then he turns around and forgets what he looks like. Verse 25, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard but doing it, they will be blessed. They will be blessed, that is made fortunate in what they do. They will be blessed in what they do. What are you trying to do? You're trying to live out your purpose to witness as the priestly body of Jesus Christ. Hands, feet, mouth, mind, and heart. They will be blessed in what they do. What are you? You're the church. What's your purpose? To be the priestly body of Jesus Christ. Those who know the word of God and apply the word of God will be blessed in what they do. Well, live out your purpose. And again, Jesus says the same thing about knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. I quoted this already, Matthew chapter 7. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down to put them into practice. You see, we take this thing, and we take it, we set it home, and we set it on the coffee table, and we go through life. And we tell Jesus, I don't want to hear anything you have to say. Let me handle this. Saying without saying, you sit there and keep your mouth shut. That's what happens when we don't open the word. We don't understand the word. We don't read the word. We don't apply the word to our life. I've got this. Unless things get really bad, and then I'm going to try to include you in my life. You ever wonder if you ask Jesus about something if you ask him about an issue, if you ask him about a problem, if you ask him about something that's going on in your life, and his answer to you is, I've already covered that. I've already covered that. Why are you asking me? Because we want this grand revelation, lights from heaven. And Jesus says, why are you asking me that silly question? I've already covered it 14 times. Go look. Go find it. Go read it. And why does he want us to search? Because when we search the how, it becomes a part of us. It rebuilds us into something new. A brand new creation tomorrow. Jesus says, I've already covered half of those things. Put these things into practice. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew, beat against the house, but it didn't fall. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't put them in practice is just a fool. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against the house. It fell with a crash. You as individuals, me, we make up the church. We are this house of God, and we want that house to stand the test and serve its purpose. If, as we've already said, living out our purpose requires knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, where do I begin? That's what we want. Where do I begin? Where do I start? with this whole thing well Genesis would be a good place but so that I can avoid a hundred eye rolls right now we've got something else we've got another place just today that we could start living out our purpose we can gain the how this summary but understand this cannot be the extent of your knowledge it cannot be the extent of your understanding and wisdom to go through your life and serve out your purpose this is where we get to Matthew chapter 22 Jesus replied Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. In other translations, in other passages, in the other uh, uh, gospel accounts, with all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets. You've heard me say this before. That's another way of saying the Bible. That's another way of saying the Old Testament. All the, all the Bible, all the law and the prophets, the entire word of God. Hangs upon these two commands. Hinges upon, it's built upon these two commands. Preacher, if I want to know how to live out my purpose, give me a summary. Where do I go? Where can I start? Jesus says, you love God with everything you, you are. You turn around and love people as much as you love yourself. Start there. Start there. Give, don't, next, next week we'll get into the specifics. That's all right. He says, start there. Let's take this one step at a time. What does it mean to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength? How do I do that? Remember our objective to live out our purpose as the church. Number one, you might want to write these down. I don't think I have any of these on the screen. We must get to know him. If we're going to love God with all that we are, that's what he's trying to convey. Love God with everything that you are. You got to get to know him. 
Because we're adding an emotional component into this love for God. And if you don't know who he is, if you don't know what he is, if you don't know his character, if you don't know what he does, if you don't know where he's going, if you don't know what he, where he's been, it is very hard to have this complete and total connection. Know who Jesus is. Get to know him. By the way, remember this. Remember, get to know him. That's important. Because when it comes to loving others, that's not one of the criteria. That's not one of the criteria. The criteria for loving God, though, is get to know him. If we do not know him, we cannot care about him. Once we get to know him, we get to see his faithfulness. Once we get to know him, we get to see his character. Once we get to know him, we get to see his protection, his provision, his direction, and his sacrifice in our lives. Once we get to know him, we get to see that he is unmoving. His mind, his heart. Once we get to know him, we get to understand that he sees tomorrow and we do not. We cannot express love to him if we don't get to know who Jesus is. We know him by his word. We know him by conversation. We know him by prayer. We know him by time. And we know him by faith. That's the first thing we got to do. If you're going to give God everything you are, if you're going to love him completely, you got to get to know who this guy is. You got to see him work. Watch him work. Know he works. What's the second way in which we love God all that we are? We've got to worship and praise him. Worship and praise him. Praising him is extending this thanksgiving to who he is and what he is. Worship him is admiration. To exalt him as the king of our lives. To admire him. To want to be in his presence. Worship and praise. That's admiration and thanksgiving. There's a reason I went with that for our communion. We have to desire the presence of Christ, desire his righteousness in our hearts. We have to thank him for what we are, for who we are, for how he continues to guide and direct our life and how he continues to give us value, mission, and purpose. If you don't do that, you're not going to love God with all that you are. If you don't worship him, if you don't praise him. You can worship God, you can praise him all the time, all day long. Number three, to love God is to put him first in everything. This is why Jesus calls this an undivided love with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That's what he means. You put him first above and beyond everything else. It almost sounds like we talked about this a little bit in our last series. Unless you hate your mother and father, unless you hate your brother and sister, unless you hate this and hate that, you have no place with me. What was Jesus saying? Love me first, above and beyond anything else. We have to put God first in our lives. We have to include him. We have to ask him. We have to listen. We have to care about his holy decree. We have to care about his character and let it be shown in our lives. You know, I've, I've actually had the conversations with people. And they've asked one thing or requested another thing. And I've quite literally said, I can't do that because I'm not allowed. I'm not allowed to do that. I got to put God first, what he wants. His word first, his decree first. You want this particular thing, you want to try this particular thing, you want to say this particular thing, teach it this particular way. I'm not allowed to do that. I would like to. It would be a lot easier. But I'm not allowed to because God's first. God has to come first in your life. Number four, to love God is to desire him. This is a yearning to be in his presence, but also a desire for his righteousness in your life. Do you desire to be righteous? Do you desire for this righteousness to grow? To not only be in this right standing with God, but desire that every decision you make honors Jesus Christ is it a desire in your life because if it's not a desire in your life if you don't foster that desire if you don't grow that desire then you don't love God with everything that you are and you're never going to get to that place of loving God with everything that you are I desire I hope you desire a righteousness about you I mess it up a lot I still have the weakness of the flesh <laughs> the older I get the more weak this flesh gets, it seems like. I still got the weakness of the flesh. 
or we must desire the righteousness of God. Number five, to love God is to obey him. Obey him. This is wise living. It's about our desire to please him. And by the way, it's about our desire to please the one we know. This is why loving God with all you are requires that you know him. Loving your neighbor as yourself does not require that you know them. Loving God with all you are requires that you know him. Loving your neighbor as yourself does not require that you know them at all. Because obedience is from a desire to please the one we know. That begins to extend in all areas of your life. A genuine desire to please the one we know, to please Jesus Christ. John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commands. John 14, 23, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them. They will come to them and make your home with them. John 15, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I've kept my father's commands, will remain in his love. First John uh, chapter 5, in fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, are they? What about in your life? Are his commands burdensome? Now, if you don't read the word, you don't study the word, and you don't ask questions about the word, you can't answer this question, okay? Because you don't know the commands of God. But if you do, are his commands burdensome? I got to tell you, sometimes they are for me. They are very burdensome. Not all the time. Sometimes they are. Sometimes how I live out my why can be very burdensome, which tells me I must be doing this wrong. I must be leaving something out. I must be putting it the wrong way around. Am I doing it incorrectly? What's his command? Matthew 22, we're going to continue on. Verse 39, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. You see, we got a nasty habit of putting, trying to put the cart before the horse and then wonder why living this command of Christ, living out our how, is so hard and so burdensome when it comes to living out our purpose. After all, it is this question. This, this verse telling us how we live out our why. But when we've given our lives to Jesus Christ, when we love him, when we want to please him, we want to be in his presence, they suddenly become less burdensome. I played soccer two nights ago again. Look, I, you know, when I was younger, I, I, did, I did the sports and I did this and I did that and I did the the exercises and the working out and I did all this stuff, okay? I don't want to do that anymore. All right, I'm done with that. I don't know about you. All right? I did that the first 20 years. This past 20 years, I'm done. All right? Now maybe I'll pick it up again later. I don't want to. I, I'll tell you what I really don't want to do. I really don't want to go outside and run back and forth in the yard all day long. I don't like doing that. I don't know. Maybe that's what you, maybe you do like to do that. I don't like it. That is burdensome to me. But going out and playing soccer with Sam's actually a lot of fun. I actually enjoy that quite a bit. I actually love it when he says, hey, let's go out and play some football. Let's go out and play some soccer. And we go running back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. I'm literally doing the same thing that I once thought was burdensome. But I'm in the presence of, I'm with, the one I know, and the one I love. Suddenly, it's not so burdensome anymore, is it? See, this is the way, this is the problem with loving others as we love ourselves. We, we, we try to do this without including and having this incredible relationship and desire for Jesus Christ. And then we try to love others, we try to serve, we try to do this. Next week, we're going to talk about different ministries. We try to do it, and it's so burdensome to us. That's because all we're doing is out there by ourselves is running back and forth and back and forth through the lawn. Throw a kid and soccer ball in there. It's a lot more fun. The things I would not ordinarily do on my own become quite enjoyable. In fact, if I try to do the same thing the next day without Sam already, it's not quite as enjoyable. The next day less and the next day less until it's become burdensome once again. 
That's the only way you're going to love other people. That's the only way you're going to serve out your purpose, serve out your why. C.S. Lewis puts it this way, to love you as I should, I must worship God as creator. When I have learnt to love God better than my earthly dearest, I shall love my earthly dearest better than I do now. Insofar as I learn to love my earthly dearest at the expense of God or instead of God, I shall be moving towards the state in which I shall not love my earthly dearest at all. When first things are put first, second things are not suppressed, but they are increased. When we struggle with the how of living out our purpose, it may be that we do not have a problem with love for other people, but we have a weak love and appreciation for Jesus Christ and what he is and who he is. Love for God requires all that you are. Love for others requires love for Jesus Christ. It is a decision of the will. I mean, after all, we're talking about our enemies as well, Matthew 5, 44. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Your love, others, because you want to please the one you know. It's not because you want to please others. People get this wrong all the time. All the time. If you love others because you want to desire and please them, what happens when you don't please them anymore? Suddenly, it becomes burdensome. Suddenly, you think it's broken. Suddenly, you think it's wrong. Suddenly, you think you've got to do something different or something else. You love others because you want to please the one you know. God must be first in our lives and our purpose, in our lives for our purpose. So if my purpose is serving as a priest, witnessing for Christ, and being his hands, feet, and mouth, and heart, and this is done by loving others, which hinges upon my love for God, how do I love God more? How do I cultivate a deeper love for God? I don't know what works for you. These three things work for me. I think about this stuff all the time. Number one is this, time. Time. And I don't mean just existing. I mean intentional, deliberate time spent with Jesus Christ in prayer, in study, and in meditation. Absence does not always make the heart grow fonder, church. It often makes the heart grow forgetful. You deliberately spend time with your groom. After all, if you're the church, you're married to him. You see, and I think this is part of the problem. We, we go through the marriage. We go through the wedding ceremony between us and Jesus. And then we just reside in the same house instead of truly live together. You need to spend time with Jesus need to understand what he is and who he is number two you need to practice 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 the things you hear from scripture practice the things that you read practice the things you know and you understand you begin to see god's faithfulness day in and day out day in and day out even on your lowest days there's a reason the old testament is there what is it showing us it's showing us god's faithfulness to his people day in and day out even when they stumble even when they fall even when they mess up You've got to practice this life with Jesus. You have to practice the things that you hear. You have to practice the things that you know and you understand. And then you really begin to see the character of Christ working in your life. And finally, the third thing, all this leading to admiration, but the third thing, thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. And there is probably not a greater moment, a greater thing, practice that you can do than thanksgiving. To build this relationship with Jesus Christ. This is reflection on your walk. This is reflection on the grace of God in your life. This is reflection on the fact that he made you. He created you. He loves you. And he built you for a purpose. This is reflection on the fact that he gave his life for everybody on this earth. But he would have done it just the same if it were just for you. This is reflection on where you were and where you are. And where you might be. Thanksgiving is realizing that Jesus gives with both hands. That he gives us mission, value, and purpose in life. And for that life, he laid down his own. You see, to really connect, to really have this love for God. We have to discover what kind of a God he is. Tony Evans tells a story of two girls, young girls good girls, you know, perfectly fine, uh, but they sit down at Thanksgiving dinner, 
mom, dad to do. And for some reason, they're arguing. They're misbehaving. They're fighting, you know, that day. And uh, dad, dad tells them, he says, look, this is Thanksgiving dinner. You're not going to act that way. In fact, if you act that way, you can't be here at the table. You can't be here at the table. You can't be with the rest of the family. You can't partake of the bounty. All right? If you're going to act that way, I want you to go to your rooms. And so they go up to the rooms. Thanksgiving, right? They go up to the rooms, sitting there dejected, you know. Can't believe this. About five, ten minutes later, mom calls them down to the table. She says, hey, come on down. Come on down to Thanksgiving dinner. So they come down. They, they sit around the table. And they notice there's only three of them. There's mom and the two girls. They say, well, where's dad? And mom tells them, she says, well, dad gave his word. He said, you, you can't be in the presence of the family if you're going to act this way. And he, he laid out his punishment. He said, but he didn't want to deny you Thanksgiving. He didn't want to deny you the bounty of his table. He said, so not only has dad provided all of this for us, he's now up in his room paying the price. See, that's, that's what Jesus does for us. He, he gives it, he provides it, and then he pays the price so that we get to partake of the bounty. That's the God you serve. That's the God that says, I want you to love people around you. That's it. That's it. I don't want you to be violent. I don't want you to know more than the next guy. I don't want you to be stronger than the next person. I don't want you to cover this many boxes or check off this many good things. He says, I want you to love the people around you. That's what God can do. He says, there's your house. There's your house. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for what our Father has done for us. We thank you that we have been given this, granted this this how. How to live out this priestly purpose that you've given us. And Father, I, I, I ask today, I ask today that your commands will not be burdensome in our lives. That you will not change your commands and you will not change your standard, but you will change us. That we will have this incredible admiration for who Jesus is, for you, who you are as Father, God, and Creator. And that we will desire and we will want and we will go through this week and we will go through our lives and we will sit around our table desiring and wanting to love people around us. Even if they don't love us even if they don't love us. Help Thanksgiving, Father, today, Thursday this year. Help it to take on this, this meaning. In your son, amen. Please stand and sing. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is good, he is above all things, his love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, his love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, his love endures forever.
church knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, real knowledge, real understanding, real wisdom, that's how you live out your purpose. And so it's not something you're doing. You need to start doing that. You need to do that in your home. You need to do that in your life. It's not like I'm going to call you out by name here in church, right? Lori and Brad, man, can you come up here a minute, please? Lori was baptized last week, and um, with all the excitement, I don't even know if we kind of did this in an official way, but they've been working with us for a while, and they, they for some crazy reason, want to make this their home, um, and, uh, but, uh, so I just want to get both of them again in front of you, so that you know Lori and Brad, they're now uh, part of this body, and you have the opportunity and the obligation uh, to love and support them. They have the opportunity and obligation to love and support you. And Lori said this uh, last week, um, and I'm fairly certain Brad believes the same thing, uh, but I'm going to ask both of them right now if they just repeat after me. I believe, I believe that Jesus is, the Christ, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. He is my Savior, he is my Savior. and He is my Lord. All right, let's thank God for this time and then welcome Lori and Brad. Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful gift that we have more now, brothers and sisters, uh, in your kingdom and eternally. And we thank you for that, Father. We thank you for the love that you've shown them. And we also thank you for that that extra bounty now that you showed this church and this body and have been uh, showing for a while. I thank you so much that they're saved eternally and they want to share and build this life with... uh, with your your children here, and I thank you for that, Father. I ask that you bless them, bless their homes, and I ask that you will bless us through them. You'll give us the opportunity to uh, serve them, and, and, and they serve us as we go through this life. We thank you so much for this. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, you should just